Good evening. Glad to see you all here this evening. Um, most of you look pretty familiar. I believe I saw you about this time last month. So we're glad you decided to join us again. My name's Rhonda. I'm one of the dietitians here at the hospital. Um, and we have Jared. He's Hello. still cooking down in the kitchen. Thank goodness for you. Um, and we do have Jackie is still with us. She's another dietitian. You guys met her last fall. Um, we also have an additional dietitian working with us. Lindsay Sparks uh, joined us two or three weeks ago. I'm really excited to have her. Uh, she's done lots of this kind of thing, so she'll be bringing lots of good ideas to us, I think, uh, in the future. And then Nellie, our dietetic intern, she's kind of finishing up her last month with us. So, um, She's going to share some things as well at toward the end of our session today. So, is that everybody? You know everybody else, right? You know each other, the person you're sitting next to, right? Again, we thank you for coming out. Um, this one is Fresh Fish Finds. So you have to say that five times really, really fast. Before we go Good luck with that. Fresh Fish Finds. So, um, we did, we did some discussion about why we even wanted to introduce fish. Um, hopefully Lindsay and uh, Jackie will be sharing more of that with you uh, as we go through this evening. Um, and then we also have just some tips for you whenever you're looking for fish. So um, what kind of fish do we have around in this part of the country? Crappie. Crappie, okay. Anybody go fishing last week when it was like 32 degrees? <laughs> Did you catch anything? Walleye. Walleye. So anybody ever go cat fishing? Cat fish? Okay. What else would we have around this area? Drum. Drum. Car. Perch. Bass. Okay. So nobody goes in the direction I live and goes to Bennett Springs for trout. No. Yes. Some yes, some no. So we do have a lot of availability in our area of that with our lakes closed and with, with the trout stream. Uh, so you do have more available. And then uh, you probably checked recently in the local grocery store. So what do we have available at Woods and Walmart and all these? Salmon. 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 Fresh salmon. Uh, they have fresh tilapia at all those locations. As I looked today, check today, it's there. Uh, so we do have those two things, and I talked with uh, one of the um, meat persons at Woods, and they do get that salmon in, he said, about four times a week. So it does come in, I think if you were to purchase it there, it probably would be pretty fresh, coming in at least that four times a week on their truck. So didn't talk to the other two locations, so I don't know how frequently it is, but it certainly is there as fresh, never frozen, so you can... You can select that. So, um, fish is a good idea because it's considered one of our leaner meats. Uh, it does have that good protein source. Um, sometimes, though, the way we prepare it, anybody ever eat, have go to a fish fry? <laughs> one, of, one of my family's traditions is a, you know, an annual fish fry. So, what are some other ways that maybe we could prepare that fish? that um, it wouldn't add that extra fat that we add to it when we fry it. We can bake it, so that's that's exactly what we thought. So we did that. Barbecue grill. Barbecue grill. Mm -hmm. Smoking maybe some of those um, those fish and, and putting them on the barbecue grill. So those are good ways not to add additional calories, additional fat, uh, that make it even more healthy for us. So the first recipe that we have tonight is going to be that pan, the baked panko crusted fish. And I bought a box of panko crusts, but I guess there's no more. They're oh, we want to be too close. So we're looking at doing um, coating it in something other than what do you do? What do you usually do that fried fish in? Cornmeal, flour, those kinds of things. So we're using a different coating the panko crumbs, so that would be a good idea to again add a less calories and be a lighter seasoning. So that's what we did with these, this fish. What kind of fish do we use here? We used catfish. Okay. And can I add something also about the panko breading? Um, what it's really good for is, is in baking. So when you do your fish with panko breading and you bake it, you're basically, you're basically giving it the texture of fried fish 
without having all the oil. Um, that's what we offer a lot of times for our cardiac patients here in the hospital is, a, is an oven fried fish or an oven fried chicken. And it's just the panko breading. It's a little bit crispier, dries up nicely, holds seasonings well. Um, and it gives that texture of a fried fish without all the extra fat. I didn't really even know you could fry with panko. I thought you had, I thought it's normally you have to bake it. Just bake it. It, <laughs> should, it should be baked, I think. It's called oven fried. Yeah. Just because it makes them think it's fried. <laughs> it's a trick. Um, so we did just did the panko breading with our catfish tonight for you to try. Um, and just used, um, you know, you probably have done that dipping in the flour and then dipping in the egg and then dipping back in our panko breading. So I think that helps add that nice color to it as well whenever you do bake it. So you could use different kinds of seasonings. Um, suggestions on seasonings, Jared? We just did a Cajun seasoning. Um, you'll want to always try to use, if you use catfish, um, douse it or spray it, mist it with some lemon juice. Um, and that'll help kind of kill that, that dirty flavor that you get from the, from the catfish from the mud line. Um, it'll, a lot of people can cut that out. Uh, you can do different things like that. Some people still say that no matter how you clean it, um, there's, there's always that flavor. And lemon juice really helps get rid of that flavor. Um, and then basically just um, take it, spray it really good with some lemon juice, season the fish itself with salt and pepper, um, and then just go through the process of, of going into the, the flour, and then to the egg wash, and then into the panko bread. Yes? Well, that lemon, I found it soaked your fish, and it was about 15 minutes of lemon juice. Look and see what, when you take the fish out, look at your lemon juice and see what it's pulled out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the same way with chicken. Yeah, it said if you soak your, your fish in lemon juice, the fillets, um, you can look and see what the lemon juice actually draws out of the fish. Um, it's pretty significant. So, um, have any of you tried the use, the using panko crumbs, you know, whenever you did any kind of fishing? You could use different, if you use a catfish, you can use several of the other things that are listed there, or any kind of a mild white fish, uh, and just prepare it in this way so we don't add a lot of extra fat to it by frying it and it still I think will be a good product so I think they're ready to give you a taste of that now. Yes ma'am Jan. I was just going to say uh, as with mayonnaise, if you use the non-fat yogurt and you say Okay. So she's used it instead of the mayonnaise uh, that is mentioned in the recipe using a non-fat yogurt so we would lessen some of the fat calories there as well and still has a good taste to it. Um, so, you probably maybe tried some of this at home, but using the panko, I think that's about the only thing that I ever do fish in anymore, except that one annual annual fish fry. That's that's very true. Yes, ma'am. Do you recommend Atlantic or Pacific salmon? Jared, that sounds like a question for you. What was the question? Atlantic. Do you recommend Atlantic or Pacific salmon? I don't know if there's a big difference in that. I, I, I've always preferred um, the Pacific salmon. Um, I've tried some like Norwegian salmon um, up in like the northern, northern Atlantic Ocean. Um, and, and they're good. Um, I just, I've always felt like there was more of a, of a flavor to the, to the northern Pacific Alaskan um, salmon. I, I don't know if there's really any difference um, because there's there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different variables that will play into into the flavor of fish, and so apart from just going there and catching one and grilling it, you know, or cooking it up myself, uh, I don't think it's really easy to to determine fairly between the two different places. Um, except you know because there's just too many variables. They could have been uh, immature, they could have been farm raised and you know not the greatest conditions in the world in the farm so um, those kind of things can play a big part in and especially softer meat fish like or softer meat proteins like fish. So. Yeah, we're going to kind of talk about that later on in our recipe descriptions but to bounce off of what Jared has talked about your fish their diet really plays a big role in their flavor profile so what they've been eating can affect that flavor, so different regions that fish might have a little bit of a difference of flavor in that sense too. So 
fish that live longer tend to be a little fattier, so even a fattier, longer-lived fish has more opportunity to eat in its environment and kind of cultivate a, a rich flavor. So just that can play a role in that. Um, in terms of difference of regions, if we're talking about sustainability, which is one thing that we might talk about later uh, when we're talking about fish, is you know, are these sustainable fishing practices? Because Americans are eating more fish, and so you know, it's looking at what kinds of practices are these fishermen using to make sure that these populations are thriving. So what you could do is go to, um, it's called Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch website to look and see if you're interested in a particular fish like salmon to see if that specific fish, um, you ask Pacific versus Atlantic, which one might be more sustainable um, to and if that's important to you. So. But we're going to move into salmon now. So Lindsay has that, so she might come and chat more about salmon and some flavor profiles and tips and tricks. Yes, question. Are you going to address the mercury issue? Okay. She <laughs> asked if, if uh, we were going to address the issue with mercury in the fish today. And also the uh, radiation that's coming from Gotcha. Gotcha. Also ask a question about, um, are we going to address the radiation issue from the Japanese um, earthquake that had happened, it destroyed the reactor, the radiation from that, they said is leaching a lot further out into the ocean and affecting the fish. It's in California. Yes. Yeah, so with the environmental concerns and the environmental pollutants, um, the research kind of shows the, the, the amounts that are in our fish um, is the parts per, I think it's parts per billion, um, is very, very, very small. And you, you would have to consume a significant amount for it to build up in a toxic way in your body. So it really, the dosage is key, is you know how much are you consuming and could you even really consume that much for it to be a problem. So we um, just encourage trying to get you know at least two servings of fish a week. And there are some that are higher in omega-3s, which are you know, beneficial for our health. Um, and then there's some that are um, lower in mercury. So I will kind of look at my list here. We've got, um, you know, the, the um, we call them the predator fish or the larger fish are higher in mercury. So that would be, anyone know? Piranha. 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 Like shark. Yeah. Shark. Um, swordfish. Tilefish. Um, big eye tuna is one type of tuna. Orange roughy. Marlin. Um, so these are kind of fish that typically we're not eating a whole lot of in this region anyway. Maybe if you're vacationing in, on the Gulf um, in Florida, maybe you might come across those. Um, and so those have the highest mercury levels that they recommend to avoid. Um, but, you know, our salmon, our um, tilapia, catfish, mackerel, sardines, halibut, you know, those are all lower in, in mercury. But the, the environmental concern, the environmental toxins, again, it goes back to how much are you consuming. So the safe range is, you know, two to, thir two to three servings a week. Uh, and that's three ounce cooked. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this particular recipe, the salmon recipe, um, I don't know if you had anything to add about some of the interesting ingredients. Um. Uh, you know, honestly, we we were we had talked about this last week using a um, like a whiskey or bourbon flavoring to it. Um, I didn't have any luck finding a whiskey flavoring, um, so we did go ahead and, and use that in the recipe. Um, uh, very very easy. Uh, process. Um, as far as the cedar planks, I actually uh, got some at Woods Grocery Store that were that were pre-wet. Um, 
soaked. Soaked. Free soaked. Yeah. yeah, that's a good word. Free soaked. Um, and it worked out really, really well because a lot of people will will buy something like what they have here that's not not soaked, uh, it's dry. Um, and then you soak it in water and you soak it for an hour or two and you think you're good. And then you get it out on your on your grill uh, and it ended up catching the bottom of your board on fire because it, it does uh, lose that moisture pretty quickly. So you're going to want to make sure that, that your cedar planks are really, really saturated. I would, I would just get a, a pan, fill it up with water, set those cedar planks on there, put some rocks on top of it, or if you've got a good brick to set on top of them, put it on there so that it, they are completely submerged in water um, for quite some time. Uh, you need the wood to basically pull as much liquid into itself as possible. Um, and I, I just don't feel like a lot of times you're going to get that just from an hour or two of soaking. Um, and it's just better for you because the great thing about something like those cedar planks is, is you can reuse them um, as long as they're not burnt up. I mean, obviously you can still use that, but it's going to be a lot harder to use it down the road, especially if you use it in the same process that you used it the first time. Um, so you'll definitely want to make sure that they are soaked well. Um, and again, on salmon, you know, some people like salmon, some people don't. Uh, what I've found is, is those that like salmon love it, and those that, that don't like it absolutely despise it. Um, so, so you have to be very careful when, when preparing a meal, something like this. Uh, for friends, you'll definitely want to ask, hey, do you guys like salmon? Because if they don't like salmon, they're probably not going to like smoked salmon even more than they don't like salmon. So. Uh, just keep those type of things in mind. The wood that you use is a, is a big issue. Um, a lot of times what will happen in smoking um, is the wood that you use is good for things like beef, um, real thick cuts of meat, uh, real dense uh, proteins. Um, and then there's some that, that are a little bit lighter of a smoke. Um, those lighter smoked woods are, are the things you're going to want to use for stuff like salmon. Okay. Um, and the reason being is, is they, they leave this bitter taste um, on, the, on, the, on the top of the fish. Uh, a lot of times that goes away in things like uh, beef and pork, um, and sometimes even turkey. Um, but you'll still get that with, a, with things like turkey and, and chicken. Um, so you just have to be very careful with the wood that you use. You'll want to get rid of any bark on the, on the tree as much as you can with something that's not going to take a long time to smoke, like salmon. These smoke for about an hour and a half on our smoker. Um, and so, like I said, it was, it was very simple. Uh, the wood looked great. The planks looked great. So I'll be able to re-soak those and reuse them again sometime. So you're saying you could just go out and get your own cedar from the, from the woods? Absolutely. Oh, okay. We yeah. thought it had to be a special um, treat. Like 12 season. What's that? Don't use 2 by 12 CCAs. No, no, no. no. Definitely don't want to use 2 by 12 CCAs. That would not be good. You definitely do not want to put that in your smoker with your food. I think you might end up with some black smoke. And so by using the cedar, we're adding a lot of flavor to the fish and not having to add as much salt or sodium. So for those of you that are maybe watching your sodium intake for your heart health, Doing little tips and tricks like that can help to you know, not have to add as much salt because that adds so much flavor. Um, so you see that we do add a little bit of salt in this recipe. Um, you know, you you really I always recommend to use a little bit less, and you can always add more. You know, at the table if you need to. Um, but the total recipe, when you look at the breakdown for the serving size, um, there's about 444 milligrams which if you're trying to stay around 2,000 milligrams a day, that allows you around six to 700 milligrams a meal. So that's within target, right? So we could have a side, you know, a non-starchy vegetable side maybe, or some other kind of low sodium side. It still leaves us some wiggle room for um, other sides and not blow our sodium budget. Um, the other thing too is that we do use some sugar in this recipe, some brown sugar. And that helps to kind of take off the, um, again, we're trying to add more flavor. So sugar is a, an ingredient that adds flavor to our foods. And it's also going to help to take off the kind of fishy taste, kind of balance it out, that kind of sweet and savory combination. Um, 
a lot. So I think, I don't know, what did you guys think? Have you all tried it? Yeah, I can smell it. It smells really good. So. Um, and then just a little bit on the Omega-3 before I wrap up, and maybe I think we're going to move on to the sushi. Yes. Okay. Um, so for the Omega-3, um, not to get too sciency, but we in America tend to get a lot more of the omega-6 and omega-9s, which so those, we have three types of fatty acids, omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9. And in America, we tend to get a lot of the omega-6, which is found in um, canola oil, corn, or I'm sorry, not canola, um, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oils, some of the oils that are a little bit cheaper and used in abundance in our food supply. And so we tend to get a lot more of those guys and not as much as the omega-3. So trying to include a couple of servings of fatty fish um, in your diet a week can help you meet the recommended uh, amounts of omega-3. So a serving of salmon um, at, from the Atlantic, um, Chinook or coho salmon, has around 1,000 milligrams um, of omega-3. And the recommendation is to try to get at least 250 to 500 milligrams of omega-3 a day. So it's a good, great source, right? So I think I'm going to hand it off to Jackie. Any other questions about salmon or this recipe? Yep. Since omega-3 is a fat-soluble mm -hmm. nutrient, can you, uh, you don't have to replenish it. It's not a daily requirement. It, if you have a thousand, that really is two days worth, isn't it? Right. Okay. That's, I like that you brought that up. So we, when we look at um, our health and our nutrients, instead of just singling out one nutrient and just trying to hit that nutrient every single day, we look at our patterns, what we do over the span of like each week. So trying to get a variety throughout the week. Um, so if you got, you know, get a couple servings a week, you'll meet that. Does that make sense? Kind of balance it out throughout the week. We don't have to get it exactly every single day. Was there another question? So is that better than taking some visual supplements? Mm -hmm. So she's asking, is it better to take, um, is that better than taking a fish oil supplement? So um, if you're not a big fan of fish, we don't like to eat fish very much, um, you can talk to your doctor about taking a fish oil supplement. Um, we always recommend to make sure you ask your provider first because it can have um, interactions with medications that you may be on um, and, and if we have too much omega-3 it can thin our blood so we want to always ask first before taking there are other sources of omega-3 in the diet through plants like flaxseed oil chia seeds black walnuts um, those are other good sources of, of plant-based omega-3 one thing about supplements too is they often just provide that specific nutrient, like your fish oil supplements are providing your, your fatty acids, whereas the fish that contains the fatty acids also is a source of protein and other trace minerals. So you're getting a lot more nutrients from eating that food source versus the, the supplements, but also a great question. So now we move on to sushi. Yes. Yes. How many of you are excited to try the sushi? How many of you aren't? How many of you didn't raise your hand? <laughs> a lot. Aren't so sure. Okay. A lot of you cheated and didn't raise your hands. <laughs> well, I used to not be a big fan of sushi. I thought raw fish kind of weirded me out a little bit. But then I started eating it more, and I really came around to it. And I think it's just the perfect little treat. It's really a balanced bite. You have your carbohydrate from the rice, protein from that, that fish. And then often it, there's a vegetable in there too, so I think it's a, a perfect little nutrient nugget. Um, and I think that it really leaves a lot of creativity in terms of what types of pairing, food pairings you can do with that sushi. And we can kind of go into that and break down this recipe and what that entails. But why we, we decided to do sushi was because I think it's a really neat dining experience. So. You know, if you bring this home, you can often make this a family experience to where you're all making your own rolls, you're all having fun in the kitchen, rolling, rolling the sushi. So I think it's very engaging in that it kind of brings enjoyment and that dining experience to your food, which is important to We should enjoy what we do and what we eat. So also, I think with the sushi and, you know, it being really small bites, 
I find that I enjoy it more because I I really slow down during the eating. So that's one thing I like about sushi too is I'm more cognizant of, of how fast I'm eating and I'm allowed. I feel like I just I taste it better. The flavors are more prominent. So this sushi. Yes. What is the point of eating brush? There must be a yeah. Um, you know, honestly, when it comes to to raw fish, um, fish is very difficult to cook. So, from a cook standpoint, I enjoy serving raw fish because you can't go wrong. There's no way to mess that up. <laughs> Jack, Jackie may be able to give you a more scientific <laughs> information. Okay. So the question fish, was, so. what's the point of eating yeah. raw fish? <laughs> Okay, so Jared brought up that it's a bit, fish that can be very delicate, so in, in not cooking it, we can often just kind of honor that flavor or that texture that that fish has to offer, because um, cooking can kind of maybe affect that, that flavor or that texture of the fish. I think, too, that it is just a, a dining preference. It's, it's safe to do when we make smart choices with our sushi. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, we can also ask why do we do other things and, and whatnot too. So, interesting question, but um, yes. How do we eat sushi? Okay, so a little lesson, a little sushi 101. So, for me, if, if you don't like putting it all in your mouth, you know, normally you would you take a whole sushi and you put it in your mouth and you eat it that way. If you feel like that's just a lot to handle, this is your first time with sushi, take a bite of half of it, because um, it, it can be a lot in your mouth. So maybe take it bite by bite and kind of kind of get a handle for that. So usually, you know, I eat it with a fork sometimes, but normally you would eat it with chopsticks. So you can take it bite by bite or take it all in at once. So however you roll. So some tips to, yes, a question over here. I, my daughter was in Japan for three years. Sushi is not all raw fish. Sushi is like a Japanese hors d'oeuvre. Sushimi is raw fish. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, she brought up the comment that sushi doesn't just have to be raw fish. It can be cooked fish too, which is true. You can, you know, it doesn't even, sushi doesn't even have to include fish. You could do beef or chicken or all veggies or all fruit. So really, it's super versatile, and that's why we that's why we have it on here today. It's just so you can kind of get a feel for what it is and, and how we can do it at home, and then you can take that recipe home and tweak it with however whatever your food preferences are. So one thing I do want to talk about with our sushi is that when we buy sushi, and you're gonna if you choose to use raw fish, there's a difference between going to the store and just buying raw fish and then buying raw fish that's appropriate for sushi. So you do want to buy sushi grade fish, okay? And so I, I kind of called around and I figured out who has sushi grade fish, which is technically a made up term. It doesn't really mean much, but other than to the market. So the market has a grade for, for fish, and so they're, they're saying that these fit the standard for safety in terms of looking at bacteria and parasites and that that's a low risk for consuming that fish. So when you do, when you make sushi at home and you want raw fish, you want to look for that sushi grade fish and you can find that at, at high B. They have salmon and tuna. Um, also, if you've heard of Foreman's Market, they sometimes will have tuna, yellowfin tuna. And then there is also Captain Craig's Seafood Market in Republic. So they, they have some too. So depending on your location and how often you, you get there, you can, you can check those out. Um, with the sushi. I think Jared's going to show you how to do it. So he'll take you through that, rest be assured. Um, but in terms of the nutrition of it, like I said, it kind of gives you that balanced meal. And um, I think the sushi rice is the most important part of it. You do want to get rice that is made for sushi, so it's your short grain rice. I found this at Walmart, that's where I had done my shopping. Um, it was a little difficult to find, I will be a little bit honest with you, but mostly because it was on the top shelf and I'm very short, so it wasn't, it wasn't within eyes, eyes reach. So um, you, you can buy sushi um, rice, um, it'll literally say sushi rice, or if you see short grain rice, that would work too. And 
Um, in this recipe, we used shrimp, cooked shrimp. So again, we're, we're not using the raw uh, fish here, but you, you can use cooked shrimp. Or you could again use the smoked salmon, or maybe imitation crab, or beef, or chicken. So you can always change out that protein, or just make it vegetarian, only do veggies or fruits. So with the, the seaweed, um, Again, Jared will go over more of the how, but when you're picking up the seaweed, which is what we refer to as nori, you do want to find the darker green nori sheets. Uh, those just have more nutrients that are a little bit better in that sense. So think of kind of when we talked about lettuce before, the darker the green, the more nutrients. So there's a, a tip with that. Um, this recipe does also include wasabi, but I think we left that out. Right. So how many of you don't like wasabi? Okay, yeah. It's one of those, you either like salmon or you don't like salmon. So I don't, we like wasabi out. Wasabi is from the cabbage family. It's, it's a blend of mustard and horseradish, and it's very bold and very strong in flavor. So a little bit goes a very long ways. And so you can, that's often paired well with sushi. Low sodium soy sauce is also a good pairing with sushi. Pickled ginger is another really good one for pairing with sushi, and that kind of cleanses your palate. So between sushi bites, you can always dip it in, in any of those those pairings. So, Jared. Yes. How do we get started? Awesome. Um, one of, for me, one of the most important things to have um, is a mat, and you can actually buy this as a whole set. Um, it makes your sushi your sushi square, so I apologize for that. Um, but for us laymen, it is way easier. Okay, comes just like this, right? Your bottom, it on Amazon. The top. Yep. Um, I actually got this one as a wedding gift from Bed Bath and Beyond. I think um, the mat is really really vital uh, because that's what what you basically pack that in, and all of these little parts and pieces are braided in with um, washable material. Um, so you can run it through your dishwasher, you can wash it by hand. The only thing that you'll want to make sure you do if you buy one is let it air dry um, before you pack it up and put it up. Um, I, even, I even run the box through the dishwasher, um, wash it by hand, just again leave it out, let it air dry completely before you put it away, um, and you should be good to go. Um, to get started, this is the first time I've ever used this brand of nori, um, and it is by far my favorite. I didn't have, I had one, one roll out of the 15 rolls I did that actually broke, um, and that's really rare. Uh, so whatever, wherever they, they got this. They got it at Walmart. 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 In um, in so fantastic stuff, right? <laughs> Um, it works really, really well. So if you're starting out doing this new, um, that's the way to go. I wish you guys could see this a little bit easier, but whenever they make this stuff out, they have a little thing that rolls across it, and it actually makes these, it's not really a perforation, it just makes a line down it, um, and it just makes it a little bit easier to uh, determine where your cuts are going to be, right? Um, if you read most places will tell you to have the long side pointing towards you, but on these particular, um, on this particular nori, if you do it that way, then those cut lines are turned the opposite direction. So, to start out, you're going to want your your rice. You want the shiny side down. Yes, sorry, the shiny I'm side the down. CB. Thank you. So who here cooks rice at home? Basically everybody? Now, hold on. Who here cooks sticky rice every single time they cook rice? No? We got a couple. You guys are perfect sushi rice makers. See? That's why I told my wife. I'm like, hey, you know what? You don't make bad rice. You just always make sushi rice. Because that's what you want. You want nice, good, sticky rice. Um, because you want it, you want it to pat down. You want it to hold everything together, right? Um, and that and that nori is going to take up some moisture. Um, now, I, on purpose, did not use sushi rice 
for our sushi? I did not. And I know that's probably like a big no no. I know. I know. I'm sorry. But but the reason I did that is because um, you're not you're not always going to be able to to use the exact ingredients that you want, right? But if you go to the internet, go to Google, and Google how to make sushi rice with long grain rice or whatever the rice that you have is, I will almost guarantee you, even if you have minute rice at home, there will be a recipe that people have tried and true and found a way to make that a good sticky rice. Does it okay? still use vinegar in those recipes, do you know? Yes. Yes. So the vinegar that is in the recipe that you have, um, that's important where after you cook the rice according to the package, you stir in vinegar, and this helps to make that rice really sticky and shiny, which is what you're going for with sushi. Yep. And the avocados, um, you're not, you're not going to have very much luck with them if they're, if they're really, really stiff. Um, so it's good to make sure at the supermarket to check those avocados. Um, the darker the color of the flesh, usually those are going to be very, 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 very um, soft. Okay. Um, the greener they are, the, the firmer they are, usually. And I say usually because the ones I got in today were very, very dark. And there were a lot of them that were still really, really firm. So. A lot of that will, will happen just basically because of the, uh, the season, the time that they're being grown. So, um, so once you get your, your rice down, you want, you want about a, well, in between an eighth and a quarter inch thick of rice. Okay? You don't want a ton because then as you go to roll this, it's all going to spew out the top. It's okay if it spews out the sides. It's very difficult to keep that from happening. Um, then you're going to put, you're going to leave about an inch border. Can you guys see that? Yeah. You're going to leave about an inch of the nori exposed, right? Um, use whatever, some people use avocado, some people like using cream cheese. Use that to kind of hold some of the items that you're putting in here uh, that are going to be easily moved and, and roll away. Uh, so if you're using crab and things like that, you can leave that cream cheese kind of exposed there so that you can use it to kind of bind and hold that together so that it doesn't roll out of the way or as you're going to roll it, move everywhere. Um, it's also really good to, to try to keep your, um, your mat as clean as possible. As you, as you go through this process, it's gonna get dirty. Um, but I just take it over the sink, spray it out, you get rice stuck in between the slats and it'll be pressed in there everywhere and your whole countertop will be an utter mess, right? <laughs> but that happens, that's okay, it's fun. That's when you just kind of step back and say, all right, clean it up. They come through and they clean up and then you go back to it. <laughs> so, um, Having a bowl going. of water next to you too can also help to cleanse yes. your hands from those sticky rice or just yes. from everything else that he's describing that's really messy sounding or just having all a right. paper towel next to you. Now during the rolling process, like I said, you're gonna leave that one inch border, you're gonna bring that up, you're going to tack it down. It's good to take all the toppings and just gently break them back, right? So that everything is compacted, everything is together. And then you're going to roll. And then once you get to the very end, you're going to hold on to that back end of the mat and you're going to press it real hard and then you're going to finish your roll put your mat in make sure all the edges are sealed the top goes on and you just gently press you don't want to push too hard if you got a lot in there like i tend to um you can blow the boards right out the side you don't want that to happen okay you just get a nice firm press on it. It's ready to come off. And don't get frustrated. Okay? Because honestly, you're not going to know what this thing's going to look like until you get it out of there, right? 
and, and there's going to be times when you'll make perfect sushi every time, and then the very last one, the one in front of 50 some odd people, <laughs> is the one that doesn't turn out right. <laughs> Pretty good. Let's give him a It works. And that's a good thing to highlight too. Often what you envision isn't always what happens out on your yeah. plate, but it's more importantly it's about, you know, what is that made of and how does it taste? It's all going to the same place anyways, right? And the cutting process is really important too. Um, your the nori is is very tough, very stretchy. Um, it's easy to come in here and just kind of throw the knife down at it and it just kind of go everywhere. So you really want to be careful whenever you're cutting and make sure that you get a nice good cut all the way through it. Take your time um, working all the way through. Okay. Be creative whenever you make sushi. Use, we use carrot sticks a lot. Um, we'll do zucchini instead of cucumber. Some, some weird people in my family don't like cucumbers. Um, cream cheese is another good thing to add in there. Um, crab meat, you can use imitation crab meat. Um, it's a lot more inexpensive and easier to use than, than real crab. Um, but just, just try it out. I mean, I've even seen recipes where people make sushi and they make dessert sushi where they use the rice and they do different types of berries and fruits and things like that and maybe some mascarpone cheese instead of cream cheese which just really helps bind those those ingredients together. Yeah, so take your food preferences and you can really put them into this sushi roll. So if you, how many of you tried it and liked the sushi that we, okay, so we had some new, yeah. So, you know, if you didn't like this combination, you know, do it those combinations that Jared maybe suggested. Asparagus is another one that you've seen in sushi rolls. Uh, sprouts, peppers, jalapenos, uh, pears, apples, so you don't, asparagus. So you know, you can you can really do anything with it too. And I'll get to your question in just a minute. Um, and then one other thing too, you can also do this, the rice on the outside. So here, what you tried today, you had that seaweed wrap on the outside and the rice was on the inside of that. Um, you can you can make it so that the rice is on the outside, and often when you go out to eat and you get sushi, you see it that way, where that rice is on the outside. It's just a matter of flipping over that that, sea, that seaweed wrap during the the making process. So it might take a little bit more effort or a little bit more experience to be able to have that coordination, but you can also you know play around with that. Um, other toppings you might consider might be chia seeds or maybe uh, sesame seeds. You could even top it with like a crab salad, so or a tuna salad, or sliced almonds, sliced mango, sliced avocado. So, I mean, it, the world is your oyster. You know, no pun intended with the seafood, maybe. I don't know. So really, you can, you can do just about anything with, with the sushi. So, question in the back. Yes. So her recommendation was, if you don't like the seaweed, you can get a rice paper, which is very true, and it it'll hold everything together and kind of remove that that sea flavor that maybe you just don't care for. Yes. Where? So the question was, where in the store do you find the nori? Okay. Rhonda did our shopping. In the Asian section, so you might find it in that cultural aisle where they have. Um, she says at the end of the end of the aisle, but that might change depending on where you're shopping. So somewhere in that Asian section. Any other last questions about the sushi or this recipe? How many of you might try this? I want to try it. I'm going to try it. So one thing about sushi too is if you go out to, to buy it, um, what you pay for at the restaurant, you can often make four to six dishes at home for that same price. So it's definitely more budget friendly to, to make your sushi at home. So we're going to wrap it up with some food safety because with fish it is important to remember that component. So 
21 is with Nelly. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and like they mentioned, um, with everything that we eat, especially fish, food safety is very important. Um, and, you know, making sure that we, um, if you're actually fishing or if you're buying it from the store, um, you know, we incorporate that uh, fish safety so we could prevent or reduce that risk of foodborne, illness, foodborne illnesses with anything that we do consume. Um, so, on our little sheet, uh, our little flyer that we've got with all our recipes, on one of the sides it has um, food safety tips, and I'm just going to kind of go over um, some of those real quick. Um, and make sure to take it home, keep it safe in case you are making fish and you forget what temperature it's supposed to be at, just to kind of have a reminder. Um, so when you're when you're buying that fish from the store, making sure that you're buying it from the refrigerator section, or if it's on some sort of like a block of ice, or in the freezer section, making sure that it's controlled, temperature controlled. A lot of times they have labels on the bags saying that it's been tempted. Um, uh, go ahead. Okay, I know sushi means raw fish. When, when you make a shrimp sushi, is it cooked or raw? It's, it's cooked. A shrimp? Uh, yeah, they, she had asked that whenever you make a shrimp sushi, is it raw or is it cooked? And like, uh, one of the ladies had said earlier, shushimi. Is, is technically um, raw fish and rice and usually they'll do like a small pad of um, wasabi on the bottom of the fish, stick it to the rice. Shushimi is, is almost always I think raw where sushi can be, can be raw and cooked. So what we utilized today was all cooked. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so like I was mentioning, some of the fish has some labels on the actual package telling us if they, if the fish has uh, timed or temp what temperature it's been at, if, um, I guess when it got uh, uh, fished or however you want to call it. Um, so just checking, checking for stuff like that. Um, definitely when you're looking at the fresh fish, um, looking at the smell, making sure it doesn't smell, um, have a, doesn't have a bit really strong fishy or ammonia smell. Make, making sure it does smell fresh, um, looking at those eyes of the fish, making sure they bulge a little bit, they're clear. Um, when you're looking at the flesh of the fish, making sure it's shiny, uh, translucent. When you press it, it kind of comes back, it's a, it's a firm, um, it springs back for you. Um, you know, there's no discoloration, there's no darkening around the edges of that fresh fish, so making sure those are, um, well, those are all just things to look for to make sure your fish is not going bad or um, so that way you don't get sick from it. Um, when you do bring it home, you want to make sure you do put it in the fridge or the freezer, depending on when you're going to use it. If you know you're going to use it right away, um, put it in the refrigerator. If not, freeze it. Um, that way, um, again, if it stays in the fridge too long, it might that smell might come, or you you might just notice something not right. So making sure that that temperature in the refrigerator is good um, and it's all sealed in a Ziploc bag, something so it won't leak in the house. Um, when you're ready to prepare your fish, making sure you're washing your hands, washing the area that you're eating, or preparing your food, or the fish that you're going to make. Um, when you're ready to thaw it out, from, if you're going to do it from the freezer, making sure you're not leaving it on the counter overnight like my mom does. Um, she does that way too many times, and I take that fish, put it back in the fridge, and she makes something more, she's like, it's not thawed out yet. I was like, well, Put in the microwave. So um, the microwave is another way you can do it. You can uh, defrost it, uh, or you can put it in a Ziploc bag, put it in some water, some ice water, and just leave it there. So it, you won't get any, um, you know, food poisoning from leaving it on the counter all night. Um, when you're ready to cook, um, making sure that uh, they say most seafood, the internal temperature of a, a, a cooked food is a uh, seafood is 145 degrees Fahrenheit um, and if you don't have a thermometer um, you can just always check to see if it flakes if the fish if you think that fork and flake it should come off pretty easily um, and they they say that it should be um, uh, opaque which I, I wasn't really sure what that word meant but uh, it just means translucent you want it to be completely <coughs> translucent um, so that's just something you want to look at with fish um, again, if you're doing shrimp or lobster, making sure that it's also, um, you know, opaque and just has like a, a pearly color to it. Um, with scallops, again, fresh, if you're doing something fresh, make, making sure that's opaque as well and firm. 
um, and then just put your oysters and your clams and stuff like that, that um, they do uh, stay open. Yeah, shells open during cooking. So if they do close, making sure that they, those are probably not ones that you want to use, so making sure that they are open. So um, just in general, food safety is very important, so you do not cause, or so your body doesn't get um, food poisoning from that. And uh, any questions about food safety? There's a fresh, uh, fresh fish market in Springfield. Hy-Vee has, has quite a big uh, supply of, of fresh fish on display there. They don't have any where the fish is swimming around. I know they have some lobsters there, at, but as far as fish go, I don't think they have any, any like that. No. If you move out to Oregon and uh, a coastal state, you might find those fish markets. So that's one thing the Midwest lacks, is, yes. is that, unfortunately. But. Another thing that you can do with your fish, you bring it home from the market. If, if it's going to be a day or two before you, before you eat that fish, um, if you're worried about your refrigerator staying below 40 degrees, um, you can always get a, uh, a bowl and a colander, put the fish in the colander, and put ice on top of it. Uh, the reason you want to use the colander is so that any, any liquid that does come off goes down there and the fish does not set in any liquid. Um, so if you put it in a pan and stick it in there and you notice that liquid is in the pan, you, you don't want that. that. That's a good way for, for bacteria to form. Um, so just be watchful of that type of, of situation. We're ready to maybe win a prize. A couple of things. Um, if you don't remember what Jared did with making the sushi, you can look at the video on YouTube on our CMH channel. So we're stars. So we're on the YouTube video for that. And then also, the recipes are on Pinterest on the CMH board. If you lose yours from tonight, you can also look it up that way. So next month um, is May 14th. Cooking class will be a very sweet summer. So maybe we'll put those berries in the sushi. We mentioned that earlier. So uh, next month it is, is it a very a very sweet summer. Uh, registration for it will open in the morning. 7 a.m. Tamara? Yes. 7 a.m. in the morning the registration for next month will be available. So you can go online.